Welcome to Monobiology, or is it Monopoetry? Today we're going to look at a concept called abiogenesis, and more particular, a particular part of the concept called spontaneous generation. For example, fish and frogs come from the sky. People believe this, but why? There's the poetry, completely by accident. Or was it? Anyway, people believe this for a long time. It's hard to imagine a world where we don't have the technology that, that exists today. It's hard to imagine a world where we don't understand where animals and plants come from. Because we learn about that in school. But 2,000 years ago, people wouldn't have. And so they could only go by what they saw. And what they saw was rain and then frogs and earthworms and fish. So they came up with the theory that made sense to them. So if they didn't come from the sky, where did they come from? And why did they only appear after a rain? These were questions that people of 2,000 years ago couldn't answer. They could, they could only go by what they saw, as I said before. So then, what is abiogenesis? Abiogenesis is the theory that living things can come from non-living matter. And it was coined, or is, is attributed to anyway, by Aristotle, who you may have heard of, a very famous Greek philosopher, and he kind of came up with the idea, the concept, uh, and it has taken nearly 2,000 years to disprove it. So why? why? Why would people believe this hocus-pocus for so long? In the past, people tended to believe those whom they perceived to be very intelligent. And Aristotle, by rights, is a very intelligent person. He may have missed the mark on this particular idea, but who are we to question him, right? So what did he do? Well, he made a hypothesis. Not necessarily a very scientific one, but he made a hypothesis. But it couldn't be tested. It couldn't be tested right away. Like, how, how, how could we test that? We had no technology to test that 2,000 years ago. So what invention, what piece of technology do you think allowed us to test Aristotle's hypothesis? Probably one of the most important uh, pieces of technology inventions for biology is the microscope because it allows us to see very small organisms for the first time. As you can see in this picture, we have a very ornate, very old microscope. We also have a joke. We have these cave people who are looking through a very early microscope at a mammoth. And obviously, you don't need a microscope to see a mammoth. That's just ridiculous. Perhaps they're poking fun at the ability of the first microscopes to see, which wouldn't have been very good compared to today's microscopes. However, Anton van Leeuwenhoek, who was the first person to develop a real compound microscope in the late 17th, in the late 17th century, 1690s to be more specific, was the first person to see a real cell. What he really saw, though, was a dead plant cell because he looked at cork, and cork is just dried up wood. So what he saw was an empty rectangular shaped box it looked like a prison cell, and that's where the name cell comes from. An organism is a living thing, and the microscope allowed us to come up, allowed us to see those living things. And more importantly, it allowed us to see what those living things were made up of, cells. Because of that, we were able to come up with a more advanced theory, moving beyond spontaneous generation, moving into the cell theory. The cell theory has three different parts. One, all living things are made up of at least one cell. Two, the cell is the basic unit of life. And three, all cells come from pre-existing cells. Kind of the opposite of what abiogenesis, or more specifically spontaneous generation is. Despite the invention of the microscope, 
Most people were not convinced. After all, how many people had access to a microscope? It took some pretty determined scientists a long time to change people's minds. Remember, people would only believe what they could see, and most people believe something that they were told as opposed to something that you know, some scientist, some wackadoodle scientist was trying to show them. So for instance, people believe that maggots came from meat or that mold and bacteria came from the air. My personal favorite, a recipe for mice. Mice, get this, come from grains and a dirty old shirt. If you leave them in a barn for 30 days, you'll have mice. Presto. Isn't that awesome? I think I'm going to go make some mice in my barn. Eventually, abiogenesis was disproved through the use of experimentation. But how does one perform an experiment? Let's find out. At this point, I would like you to either watch the video on Francesco Redeye or read the document I provided on the Moodle site about his experiment to see how he showed abiogenesis wasn't true. The scientific method or experimental design starts when a scientist asks a question. We will use this one. Do maggots come from meat? A hypothesis is made. Maggots do come from meat, or maggots don't come from meat. The variables are determined, and an experiment is performed. Keeping in mind, an experiment only tests one variable at a time. The independent variable for this experiment is whether or not Maggots come from meat. So, sorry, the meat, the access to the meat, whether or not, so for Red Eye's experiment, it's the access to the meat, whether or not the flies can get to the meat. The dependent variable is whether the maggots grow, okay? So measuring how many maggots grow. In Red Eye's experiment, all, it was very simple. He simply covered up some meat and didn't cover up some meat, and watched what happened. And of course, the only meat to end up with maggots was the one the flies had access to. Now, funnily enough, even with that experiment, people didn't believe it because, yeah, the maggots didn't grow on the meat, but it still started to get green and, and get smelly. So bacteria still grow. So bacteria now, they came from the air. Oh. And so that took another long time, and it was eventually a man named Louis Pasteur who showed that bacteria are, in fact, tiny cells that grow on the meat eventually and break it down and start to produce the putrid odor that you, that you get when meat starts to rot. But that was a couple hundred years after Red Eye did his first experiment. Louis Pasteur is more famous for the pasteurization of milk. He also came up with a vaccine for rabies. Also a philosopher, did a, lot of, did a lot of work. The rest of the scientific method is in your Designing a Controlled Experiment booklet. And of course we will be performing, or I already have performed an experiment, so you can fill in the rest of the scientific method or you can just look in your booklet. That in a nutshell is spontaneous generation and how it led to the cell theory. Make sure you bring your questions to class.